if we throw all the terms out completely, it's like, ah, who needs those things? Uh, We may be throwing the baby out with the bathwater because there may be something in some of those terms that have some real depth of meaning. Christian terminology, today on In the Shadow of the Cross. Shadow of the Cross. I am Lauren Rosser, and I am here with my friends. Well, it's 4:20 today, so <laughs> they're going by the names Cheech and. No, no, we ain't going by no nothing, man. We're not going by no nothing. No fake names. These are real names, man. We're from California. Yeah, they are. It's funny. All three of us are from California, even though two of us live completely somewhere else. But but Jim is in. We, we, we live there in our hearts, man. It's in our hearts, you know. Yes, Jim is in Where's... Humboldt County, so he's he sees oh. this every day. <laughs> Dave, Dave's not here, <laughs> right? Jim's not here. Who's Jim? Who's Jim? <laughs> it's Jim. Jim's not here. <laughs> I don't know what we're talking I, about. I, 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 think like... the, I think the I think the cops followed me here, man. Open the door. <laughs> <laughs> it's an old Cheech and Chong skit. And for those of you who aren't familiar, guy comes knocking at the door, saying his name is Dave. They're going, Dave's not here. I thought you were going to be Dave, Lauren. <laughs> I was. I yeah, forgot I to change my name. Any, anyway, uh, so I'm here with Jim Durkin and Michael Harden. And, uh, you know, the topic we wanted to discuss today, we, we thought it would be cool to talk about terminology. And, and as we were talking about this getting started, the first thing that came to mind for me was when I was in high school and I was on uh, coming home from a field trip with a bunch of classmates. And it's a good day to be high in school, you know, high. <laughs> high yeah, and it was in high school. So, <laughs> but, but this, I was sitting across the aisle from a, uh, from a friend of mine who's, who's Mormon. And, uh, these guys are, these guys really are acting like yeah, it's more 20. <laughs> <laughs> um anyway so i'm sitting across the aisle from this friend of mine who's mormon and he's and, and we start having this conversation you know because i'm i'm in, i was a, a baptist and so we start having this conversation about uh about god and in the bible and stuff and as things were coming up it was it was interesting because we would use the same term but have completely different meanings for it And so he was going, oh, wow, we really think the same way. And I'm sitting there thinking, we really don't. We're just using the same terminology, you know. Um, And and so we, as I've grown and life has changed and I've seen things different and stuff, I'm discovering the same thing has happened with my pursuit of Christ and how I'm reading scripture of how things I was raised in back then in those days as a Baptist and then becoming a charismatic, a terminology that I use that was common is still used, but it has completely different meanings. And so I thought it would be cool to open this up and, and look at some of these terms. So let's start with, um, I thought it'd be cool to start with a uh, born again. That that's a term that was big in in the Baptist church I grew up in. You know, uh, you have to be born again. And it's funny because I remember one time talking to a Lutheran friend of mine. His dad was a Lutheran pastor. He's one of my best friends. And I and I said to him about being born again, and he goes, "I don't know what you're talking about." <laughs> he goes, "He goes, you just have to believe in Jesus." And I was like, "Uh oh, is he saved?" Yeah, there's another one. <laughs> there's another term. So let's start with uh, let's start with that. Let's start with born again. So I'll throw it out to you guys. Uh, how is that typically used or perceived and and how uh how is that now what what does that mean now uh jim let's start with you uh that's that's a that's a really good question and it, and it's it's in some ways it's an intriguing question because those people that use that terminology and and of course uh, as a charismatic evangelical i used it for years um 
point right back to, wait a minute, uh, I didn't come up with this term. Uh, Jesus came up with it, uh, you know. And recently I was asking a, a, a fellow minister, I said, <clears throat> it's an interesting question, this born again, um, because Jesus said it to a religious leader, okay, um, possibly a couple of years before he died on the cross. So is he telling Nicodemus, it's like, hey, hang around in your religion for a couple of years, and then I'm going to die on the cross for your sins, and then you can get born again at an altar call. Uh, you know, I mean, it's like, uh, let's let's talk about this. Um, <clears throat> I'm in the process of a, a very interesting project. I'm, I'm taking... Uh, my mom's memoirs, she wrote them many years ago and thought maybe one day she'd, you know, make a book out of it or something like that. And and um, my mom was an incredibly awesome woman. Um, she had an experience with the Lord um, when she was a young girl. Uh, she was a minister, graduate of a, a Bible college. We, she was a minister uh, on uh, Native American um, to Native Americans uh, on several different uh, to several different tribes and whatever. Long before she met my dad, and in that she tells a story of how she came to the Lord, and, and maybe that'll be a term that we'll talk about, us coming to the Lord, us getting saved, um, you know, things like that. And um, she says that, that periodically her church that her family went to would have a visiting minister, and he would give something uh, that they called an altar call for anybody who wanted to ask Jesus into their heart. Um, it's kind of an interesting term, term also, but, um, and so he would ask whoever raised their hand to come up front and, um, <clears throat> sit on the altar bench there and he would talk to them for a couple of minutes and then he would shake their hand and tell them they could go back and sit down and <clears throat> now they have Jesus in their heart. And she said, um, one day, uh, a few years later, she said um, there was a lady evangelist that came to their church, and um, she did the same thing. And my mom was thinking, ah, you know, it's like I've done this so many times, and all you do is go up and listen to the guy talk and shake his hand. Then he said, "Okay, now you got Jesus in your heart." But I still don't feel like, <laughs> you know, I'm I'm a good girl. I'm you know I'm still you know do. Uh, bad things or, you know, whatever, this lady, she, but she finally decided to do that. She goes up, sits on the altar. The lady starts to talk to him and then ask the, ask the people to kneel down and ask the Lord to be their savior, not come in in a heart, ask the Lord to be their savior. And the woman kneels down with them. Mom said she got up from the altar, went back and sat down, and she had the sensation that something actually had transpired. And from then on, she knew she wanted to read her Bible. She had a desire to uh, spend time with the pastor and learn about things and, and whatever. And... In her memoir, she says, that was the day I got born again. Now, that's the typical evangelical um, idea of um, what Jesus was talking to Nicodemus, that it requires uh, some type of a decision on our part to ask the Lord to forgive us for our sins, to ask the Lord to become our Savior. And an another term that we may get to later 
is somewhere down the road, after you've asked the Lord to be your Savior, then you ask him to be your Lord. So he is both Savior and Lord. But that's a, a, I don't know if that's sanctification, a second definite working of grace or, you know. So I'm sure there are a lot of our listeners that have heard these terms and maybe are still still wondering about them. Um, If we throw all the terms out completely, it's like, oh, who needs those things? Uh, We may be throwing the baby out with the bathwater because there may be something in some of those terms that have some real depth of meaning. Um, but, But here's what I've heard in evangelical or charismatic circles. You cannot convince me that what has happened to me isn't real. You can only convince me that what I've interpreted words in a book to mean may not be real. And that's kind of, you know, so to my mom, who's who's been with the Lord for many years now, um, you could never have convinced her that all the other times of going up and listening to the story and shaking hands with the pastor did not get her born again. It wasn't until that one time when she did the right things. Uh, sometimes we uh, we call it saying the right prayer um, is what gets you born again. So, um I'm going to stop there and let Michael pick it up from there. I'm sure he'll use a few $50 words and explain it all to us in a way that none of us can understand. <laughs> well, it's a good thing Michael's not here today, man, because we got, we, we're going to have some fun with this. No, uh, so, yes, so, um, uh, as I understand the language of being born again, making a personal decision for Jesus, um, that has very, very much been a part of the evangelical ethos in in from the late ninth, from the nineteenth century, even. Um, uh, real, real quick, can you pause real quick because uh, I want to follow mm-hmm. follow that with a question. Um, so is, is that when it really did become? Well, it's it's going to be it's century? it's going to be after the it's going to be after the Second Great Awakening uh, the with the influence of Charles Finney here in America, the Wesleyan movement in America, where you know I mean think about this. I mean most most of America is is still um, east of the Mississippi. You know. And yeah. the churches, the churches, uh, the Methodists especially were out there planting church, and the Catholics, of course, but the Methodists were just out there planting churches in every little, any town that sprung up anywhere, the Methodists were there. And along with that comes that aspect of Methodist piety, mm-hmm. which is having the strangely warmed heart, as John Wesley puts it, right? Uh, okay. Okay. So... That gets combined with uh, this Baptistic emphasis on free will. And so we make a choice for the Lord. Now, getting getting saved in Calvinism, of course, is not our decision. Right. It's God's decision who's elect right. and who isn't elect. And the reaction to that is this hyper kind of Arminian Baptist free will plus this Wesleyan emphasis on personal experience, okay? Yeah. So that I, to be born again becomes a way, it's a code word, it's a way of saying, I chose my relationship with God. Mm-hmm. And, okay. and, I, and, and it's because I made that choice, I have an experience, mm-hmm. okay? Okay, I, I didn't get, realize get, it was that recent is why I was, I'm, surprised well it's post you have to think post bill bright post billy graham i mean billy graham really really was the one that that made hay of this you know um uh insisting on on the altar call and having a personal relationship with jesus you know and on and on okay so 
that's that language. It's what that language is trying to express is that there was an encounter with God, right? Now, the thing is, the gospel is, is about precisely that encounter. It is. But the emphasis is not on us and our decision. It's on God and God's decision to encounter us as a reconciliatory God. Okay? So the the current or the the way the evangelicals uh, use this language to dr- describe an experience, it's a very backwards experience. Okay? And because then what happens is, you know, I choose, therefore I'm saved, therefore I go to heaven when I die, you know, all the, all the stuff that goes with that. Uh, he didn't, she didn't choose Jesus, so they're going to burn in hell, you know. Um, my sense is that it's kind of a narcissistic approach to the faith because it becomes about me. And we've seen since the uh, 1980s what's happened in America as Christianity became all about me, the consumer. Right. You know, and so pretty soon churches had to have McDonald's and coffee shops in them and bookstores and this and that. And they, you know, they, they, they had to be trendy and fashionable and this and that. And, and, and we became just simple, entertained consumers. And it was all about me. Well, and I've, I've also very... seen, I've also seen a separation that has emerged of, because I said this prayer I'm in and right. you haven't, you're out. And That's so it's correct. me, like you said, it's the focus is on me having done something. That's right. That, that's real. That's seriously. It's it's very, very, very problematic uh, when you when you get down to brass tacks on this, because it it, it 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 removes God from the equation. You know, there is no emphasis here on what God has done, except except through that sacrificial lens of God sent Jesus to appease His wrath and all that that in the four spiritual laws. You know. Um, that that's about that's about the only place where God does something. God God decides to to send Jesus so he can get pissed off at Jesus instead of you. Like like that's good news, really. This right. Is good. This is good news, you know. Um. So yeah, that that's how I would tend to parse that out. You know, um, I'm very suspicious. You know, when I I understand when people's you know they've asked me you know are you born again and I just look at them and I tell them. I said, I hope I'm becoming born again. You know, it's like somebody asked Soren Kierkegaard, the Danish philosopher, if he was a practicing Christian. And he says, no, but I'm practicing to become a practicing Christian. Right. (laughs) (laughs) So (laughs) anyway. Yeah. Yeah, I I have some other thoughts here. One is um, this come, this is the come to the Lord thing. We have to come to the Lord. Uh, no, no, no. The gospel is that God has come to us, you know, um, I, for my money and Douglas Campbell has demonstrated this brilliantly in the first 475 something pages of his big fat book, Deliverance of God. And then he and John DePew in Beyond Justification laid it out perfectly in a much uh, more elegant and, and easy to read manner for people like me. Um, and that is that the, the entire evangelical message is exactly the reverse of what the gospel is. Oh, interesting. It, it's the anti-gospel. It really is the anti-gospel. The gospel is about the non-sacrificial God and evangelicalism is about the sacrificial God. The gospel is uh, about the loving father with no dark side. The evangelical gospel is about the 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 God who struggles within himself because he's 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 both really pissed off when he's drunk, but he's really happy sometimes too. You know, right. so, <laughs> yeah. I mean, everything about the evangelical message really is the opposite of the gospel, and that's why you know I, people say to me, you know, where do I go to church? I tell them I don't know anymore. Yeah, you know, I I look out on the church landscape and. You know, I see the same exact thing being preached from every pulpit in a thousand variations, but it's right. all sacrificial. Yeah. So so we're t- talking about that. We started with the phrase born again. Mm-hmm. Um, 
how how would then and, and Jim made a really good point when he said that uh, Jesus talking to Nicodemus was he telling Nicodemus okay I'm gonna go to the cross you keep just doing your thing until <laughs> I die and come back and then you pray this prayer make your decision and and come to me so what what is meant by born again well, okay so first of all allow me allow me a little poke in the evangelical ribs. Um, the Greek text there uh, uses uh, anothen, and anothen with reference to time means again, but with reference to space means from above. So uh, when uh, Jesus says to Nicodemus, you must be born anothen, Nicodemus gets it all wrong when he's thinking temporarily and he's going, how can I be born again? That's impossible, right? Uh, when G- and then Jesus is going to riff and say, no, you don't get it. It's about being born from above, you know? So first of all, the evangelicals, they can be all born again as they want. I'm going to be born from above. <laughs> right. <the> <laughs> uh, no, that's just a little riff. Um, your question again was? Uh, what, so what is the terminology? What does the term born again mean? Yeah, well, in, in again, in the Gospel of John, it's not referring to having an experience of a personal relationship with Jesus. It was referring to a way of seeing, a way of perceiving things. And we, we I mean, this is, this is one of the amazing things about John chapter 3 is that you have a whole series of double meaning words in John chapter 3, words that mean two things or more, okay? And the writer uses these words intentionally. Because we, he, the writer's trying to get us to stop thinking in terms of the lower sphere, and you know, born again, and get us thinking in this higher level, this upper sphere, born from above. Oh, okay. And so you have words like pneuma. Pneuma can be breath, it could be wind, it could be spirit, you know. Uh, you have um, phone. Phone can either be voice or sound. So then the, the pneuma blows where it wills, but you don't know what its phone is. What's the pneuma? What's the phone? Right. Right. Um, I mean, you've got hupsao, which means to raise up, to exalt and, you know, like um, humble yourself before the Lord and he will exalt you, you know, to really lift up high. We say Jesus is exalted. We think, you know, in the heavens and the angels. And, but in the fourth gospel, that verb hupsao, to lift up is the ultimate exaltation six feet off the ground on a criminal's cross. Right. You know? Wow. So, yeah, so we have all these double meaning words in this chapter. And, there, and, and one of the things about John chapter three is the writer's been h- hammering home from the very beginning uh, after the prologue, uh, just so much of this through the use of Christological titles in chapter one to the showing of this shift in, in, uh, between whatever's in the jars, whatever the jars represent at Cana, and then the new wine that's in the old water, the new wine. And then, of course, follows that with the uh, so-called cleansing of the temple episode right there in the first week of Jesus' ministry, right? Yeah. The, this old, new, old, new, old, new. And then all of a sudden, oh. boom, chapter three, it's this lower, higher, lower, higher, just, just trying to get us to shift our thinking to another plane. That's so that that that's where John chapter three, I think, you know, really kind of it, it, it's a, it's a, I'm not going to say it's a contradiction of what the evangelical believes, you know, but it all I could say it almost is because it has nothing to do with having a personal relationship with Jesus and everything to do with changing how we see this good news, this message that's embodied in the figure of Jesus of Nazareth. That's really cool. And I like how you pointed out that the contradiction of old, new, old, new going through, because then it makes a lot of sense when you get to born again, it's another one of those old, new no. uh, comparisons. Mm-hmm. So he's saying mm-hmm. it's, it's, you, you have to go through this or see things different, have a, a, yeah. a new way, just, just like you said, with the, 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 um, the wine and the wine skin, you know, kind of right. kind of old, old wine skin. So that's, that's really cool. Um, I want, I want to throw out another phrase. Um, and this one, I want to give a little background on why, how this one first gave me trouble. It was reading in Acts. And this is the word uh, saved. And I'm, I'm reading Peter's sermon in Acts 
where you know he leads the thousands to Christ, and that was always a big one in the in in the uh, church circles I ran because it's like we wanted that, you know, revival, you know. And the thing that was interesting in when Peter preaches his sermon, he tells them, "Be saved from this perverse generation." He doesn't make any reference to be saved from hell or anything to do with heaven and hell. So that, that was the first time that began to kind of make me go, I'm not sure I'm seeing or using the word saved. It's like, what, what is it? That guy in princess bride where he says inconceivable. I do not think you know, I don't know. You keep using that word. I do not think you know what it means. Exactly. (laughs) And I'm like, I, that's what I felt like about myself with using the word saved. So right. let me let me throw this over to Jim. Uh, Jim, your thoughts on the word saved? I think, uh, again, I think I've always heard it in terms of, or an analogy is used, that if I was on a plane and uh, that plane uh, had engine failure and was going down, Uh, And I knew that most of the people around me uh, in just a matter of seconds was going to be in hell for all of eternity. Would I sit back uh, and just kind of fold my arms and say, well, (coughs) who cares? Uh, I'm going to heaven. So, or would I uh, feel an urgency to stand up and, get as many of them saved as possible. <clears throat> even even with that, I'm thinking, okay, wait a minute. The plane is going down, and it's going to crash. And we're going to see a fireball just seconds before, you know, we're all consumed. Um... <laughs> and I'm supposed to be worried about making sure they don't go to hell. Uh, I'm not supposed to be worried about, is there anybody else that can fly this plane? Uh, or somebody? <laughs> you know? uh, <laughs> um, that was brilliant. That's funny. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm like, okay, well, if that's the worst... And of course, that growing up, that's what we were taught. Uh, it's appointed that a man wants to die, and after that, the judgment. I I remember hearing a, a preacher one time. Uh, I, I think, uh, uh, Cheech, you're going to like this one. All right. I hear this preacher one time, and he's he's saying all these people that think they had a near death experience. You know, they died and went to heaven, yeah. or, or they died and went to hell. Right. Never died at all. Right. Because if they had of, they wouldn't be back to talk about it. It's a point on the band wants to die. We only die once. Okay. And I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, oh, what about Lazarus? <laughs> he died at least twice. At least twice. <laughs> right. Uh, so, anyhow. Um, <clears throat> I guess I'm a bit of a rascal. I guess a lot of uh, my church experience, I sit there uh, quietly thinking, this guy up front doesn't know what he's talking about, but whatever, for this reason or that reason. So, yeah, get saved. You need to get saved uh, so that, When you die, you won't go to hell as long as after you get saved, then you obey the Big Ten at least and maybe some of the other 630-some, you know, the, the ones about eating, you know, shellfish, those don't apply anymore, but... No, but the ones about smoking, drinking, apply. dancing do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, cutting yourself off if you're a man, that one doesn't apply, unless you want it to. Uh, but, uh, you know, yeah, so this uh, this term, saved, 
save sanctified and on the way to heaven. Uh, <laughs> or what saved always saved, or, you know. Uh, I think there's a lot of people confused on that term. Well, you, you take a road trip anywhere and you see along the side, especially out in the middle of nowhere, you see these signs say, Jesus saves. Jesus and, and you saves. think to yourself, yeah. Uh, yeah, I really I really should start saving for retirement, you know? <laughs> it, it's like, so, Jesus yeah, saves, it's like, so should you. <laughs> exactly. Or, or back so, in the day, people say, Jesus saves, green stamps. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> So that yeah, that's that's another one. So what what does that even mean? So again, it's it's like I was saying there um, a little bit ago. The emphasis of the gospel is is that in fact God saves us in Jesus. That's the good news. We have and it's a good God. Whereas the evangelicals turned everything on its head and turned it into a narcissistic consumer religion. Okay. So, f- first of all, their whole understanding of what being saved is and what, and what that's going to include for them. I mean, if you're really going to be serious about this, being saved at a bare minimum is saying the prayer at the end of a chick tract. You know, dear God, I'm heartily sorry for having offended thee and I detest all my sins. And oh, no, wait, that's the Catholic confession. Anyway. It's got some little prayer there. We accept Jesus in your heart, you know, and okay. And, and, you know, and, and then you stand up and the person says to you, you're no born again. You're it's like, it's like, it's like, I got my ticket to heaven. Woo! Okay. So that piece is covered. Right. And then everything after that, you know, going to church by going to Bible study, doing the do's, not doing the don'ts, everything that comes with that package now gets dumped on you. And to, to participate in that dumping process is to be saved. It's totally slow. It's backwards. It's wrong. Because the gospel is not about us, man. It's not about our choice. The gospel tells us the only choice that we, that we could make is to kill Jesus. That's the choice we all make as human beings. We, we kill each other. We scapegoat each other. We all participate in this. It's, it's endemic to our species, man. That's our choice. Our choice is to kill God. God's choice was to forgive us. And so the the good news has to do with with the character of God, whereas the evangelical message, they're still stuck with that two-faced alcoholic God in the sky, and they have to make all kinds of excuses for him, and then they expect that drunk to write a perfectly inerrant Bible. (laughs) It ain't any work, you know? Yeah. So, so if when the Bible, when the word "saved" is used, what are we being saved from then? What, what are we? We're not being okay. So we're being saved from ourselves. That's what we're being saved from. But the, the question the Scripture wants us to, to to move our heads around is, who is it that is saving us? Okay, that's that's the question Scripture is trying to get our head around is the kind of God that is redeeming us, is saving us. Because in relation to that kind of a God, everything changes. Mm -hmm. Everything changes. The way we think, the way we understand, the way we live, the way we care, the way we do relationships, the way we understand ourselves. Everything changes. And it's good news because it's good news that throughout our life, throughout the process of the time of our life, the changes, you know, some are incremental. Most most of them are incremental, and once in a while there's a big one. But most of them are incremental, you know. And and when we, we, we honor that, when we honor that it's God's doing the work, not not us. This isn't about me. It's not, it's not even about my spirituality. It's not about my prayer life. It's not about my experience with Jesus. None of that means a hill of beans to anything or anybody and never should. You know, it shouldn't, because each of us is going to have our own unique experience where we filter things, the way we understand things. And by recognizing the uniqueness of our filters, each one of us, and not requiring the other person to have our filters, now we are can only talk about God, not ourselves. Yeah, that's good. That's good. You know, I'm I'm thinking back so, to what. Oh, go ahead. Well, I'm just saying, being saved has to do with God. God saves. God, the Father, 
the Father sent the Son and the Spirit through the Son to, to, as we talked about earlier in the Gospel of John, to move us from one way of seeing and thinking to another. What was interesting, Michael, you just said that getting that he's saving us from a, an old way of thinking to a new way of thinking. Um, yeah, and, yeah. From ourselves. He's saving us, us from, from ourselves. ourselves. That's right. Because and so that of, brings up the that, that perfectly ties into the next term that I have here on the list. So okay. I want to jump into this one. Um, the next one, which I think has been horribly abused and misunderstood, repent. Um, I you know repent is is used all the time. Kind of goes along with our morality podcast from the last few weeks. You know, repent. Stop watching bad movies and well, dirty movies, not bad movies. <laughs> you can watch all the bad. You can watch all the bad Christian I, movies. I, I wanna, you want. I want to know what what really constitutes a dirty movie. What's a dirty <laughs> movie? Somebody well, has to depend, define that for me. You know, it, it, it depends on the circle you're in. Uh, it, you uh, know, f- for me, it was rated R movies. You know, our, our dirty our, movies, uh, oh, our bad dirty movies. movies. Um, but uh, okay. you know. Uh, stop uh repent now would be uh you know stop doing certain things stop hanging around with certain people you know um uh stop i'll just put it bluntly stop being gay you know in some circles that's what it means to repent you know so repent is this thing of of stopping getting your morality right and uh and so what what is is that what repent means is is that what Jesus was preaching? Is is that what what is meant by that? Is Lauren? Is it getting your morality right? Is it you, or is it you getting my morality right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you're right. The way it's preached, it's getting getting me aligned with your morality, the one that's preached from the pulpit, or the person who's telling me to repent. I need to align with, be in favor of having the Ten Commandments on my classroom wall. I need to be in favor of uh, of of uh, you, you know get, getting born again in the old terminology we were talking about earlier. Um, all, all those things. I need to stop watching bad movies. I need to stop supporting politicians who support I don't know abortion. You know, so yeah, so that that would be the the mindset for what repent is is aligning with a particular group, even though they would say you're aligning with God. It's aligning with a a particular group's morality. So it's always, the word is usually always um, used in connection with a couple other words. It's repent of your sins. I know you've heard that. Yeah. Yeah. Repent, repent of your sins. You need to repent of your sins. Yes. Or your sins. Yep. So it's I I need to I need to stop doing my bad things, and however those bad things are defined. I don't know if it's Cheech over there or if it's Michael, but he has a really puzzled look. <laughs> on his face. What are you boys talking about? Oh man, you want me to repent? Oh, okay, man, but. First, before I can repent, I have to pant first, right? Because to repent means I gotta pant. So, what does it mean to pant, man? Because then I can repent. One time on a long trip, I think I pinted in my. Oh no! Then I don't want to repent. No. I gotta stop hanging around you guys, man. I tell you, I I, I used to be much more serious. That cracks me up. I need to repent. I never pented the first time. I don't even know where to start. Well, you look in your pants, man. Did you pant or not? Jim almost did a spit take right there. He did that right after he took a sip of coffee. I didn't sip it. I knew where it was going. Oh, good for you. <laughs> oh, God. I pent in my pants. Hey, that's alliteration, man. Pent in my pants. <laughs> um, repent. You'll remember at the time of the Reformation, one of Luther's beefs with the Latin Vulgate 
and the Catholic Church was that um, Jerome back in the fifth century had tr translated uh, the, the Greek metanoia with um, uh, to, to do penance in Latin, do penance. And that's because there, there was already uh, a, a emerging penitential system. I mean, St. Patrick brought the penitentials to Ireland in the uh, fourth and fifth century. You have uh, Tertullian already back at the end of the second, beginning of the third century, structuring what is now the Catholic uh, sacrament of confession, you know, with the three parts, contrition, confession, satisfaction. That's, that's built there into the <clears throat> Western early church. And um, so Luther says, no, it doesn't mean uh, to do penance like the Catholics want us to do so they can raise money, according to Luther. Uh, it, it's rather to be translated as um, repent, the, the kind of the way we would use repent, meaning don't sin anymore, you know, or get, but it's been pointed out uh, a fair amount uh, in the last 50, 100 years that uh, the Greek metanoia uh, means uh, to, to change your way of thinking, you know, change, change how you think. God's kingdom is near. God's reign is near. Change how you think. Okay. Uh, and, and I think that's, uh, that's okay. Uh, I use that. You know, when I'm when I'm talking about repentance, and to, to repent is to change how you think, not what you think, because what you think will automatically change with how you think. You have to change how you're thinking. Um, but but metanoia in the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament, translates the Hebrew term shuv, which means to turn. And we can think of all those texts in the prophet where God begs the people, just turn, just turn back to me, turn back. I'm here, turn around, turn around, you know, and, and to repent is, is, is to do exactly what the prodigal son does. He turns back to his father. It's that turning back and moving toward his father. That's the, rep the repentance, you, you see. It's that turning back to, to the goodness of the father. And, and this is the cry of repentance uh, in the prophets. Turn. God, God is always saying, turn, shuv, turn. And we translate it as repent. So we think God's up there as the lawgiver. You got to get, get, get all that sin out of your life. No, 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 no. It's, a, it's an invitation you know, to, to grace. Um, so however, I'm going to think of metanoia in the New Testament to repent means to change the way you're thinking about things. You, 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 you're looking at them wrong, you know? I, I love that. I want to, I want to camp there a second. Cause I thought that was really good. It's not, it's not change what you think, because like I'll, I'll even, even like Paul, when he talks about, you know, uh, the renewing of the mind, you know, mm -hmm. I've, I've watched Christians, you know, the, stop thinking bad thoughts, stop thinking these things. And, and, you know, once again, the, the, the sin police come along and you start policing your brain and, and, but it's how you think. And like you said, that, right. that the other follows once you change how you think, but, but I thought that was really good that, it's there's something something amiss with the way we think <laughs> that that it's we have to change our whole way of thinking can you guys expand on that the, 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 what what does that even even look like or mean i i, I think that's a uh, <clears throat> i think that's a good and an honest question what does it mean that i think how i think has changed um, and, and, and I think it, it has a lot to do with uh, what Michael's saying, the broader definition of that word uh, metanoia is, is to turn. To... So my thinking takes a turn. My thinking takes a turn in the direction of, um, for instance, uh, when I teach on the uh, foundation of the heart, um, one of the things I say that the, I believe very possibly the very core belief of humanity is I am the center of my universe. And we build everything from mm -hmm. there. So we even build our religious beliefs on that. Yeah. Um, 
the deepest level to me in for instance in this conversation the deepest level of repentance and turning or changing my way of thinking is i no longer think in terms of individuality i no longer think in terms of personal lord and savior i no longer think in terms of um how God um, chooses to bless me and blah, 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 blah. I actually turn from myself, which I'm not saying that I, if this is true, but I heard a man one time say, that's what it means to die daily. I turn from myself and I turn to where God becomes the central figure uh, and even my relationship with God, the way I think about my relationship changes. It's not about, yes, I have God in my corner, you know, and together with God, we can beat up the devil. It's like, uh, it's God's my father. He loves me. He approves me. He, you know, he gave me the, he gave me the whole kingdom freely. He put a robe on my, uh, you know, he put a robe on me. He put shoes on my feet. He put a ring on my, you know, he killed the fatted calf for me. And it isn't the old individualistic thing. It's really a whole new way of thinking where I no longer you know, I no longer make it about me. I make it about how wonderful he is. I make it about how I'm approved now. Not if I change this and change that and start doing this and start doing that. I'm approved now. So. That's, that's awesome, Jim. And I like that you tying it in with the prodigal son because we see that the father runs to him and receives him before the son ever goes through his spiel about repenting or anything like that. Um, well, Kenneth I, Bailey pointed out, if you look at the son's plan, he says, I'm going to go back to my father and because the servants are eating well and I'm going to say, look, man, I'm, I'd like to be a servant and I'll pay you back. Bop, bop, bop. But the son, when he gets there, that plan is gone. Yeah, there's no there's the son realizes that his plan was a transactional, and it's gone. That's it. His 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 plan was manipulative. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, I understand how things work. I understand that. Um, if, if, if a man has a rebellious son, he can bring him to, you know, to, to the priest. He can bring him to, and the townspeople can stone him. <laughs> a 420 man, everybody needs to get stoned. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were going there. <laughs> I understand that I've already spent my whole inheritance. I don't have any more coming. Hmm. And I don't have a right to be called a son, but I'm eating pig slop. Right. And my dad's servants eat really well. So, you know what? I think I'll go and just tell dad, look, just make me a servant. Just hire yeah, me. Just hire me. Forget sonship. Yeah, right. Forget sonship. Forget... That's not repentance. No. His heart did not change. He was still the bratty little kid that wanted his full inheritance, and now he just wanted a full belly. Yeah. I mean, that's the way I no, see I, it. I think that, he, you know, that's good. That's good. Uh, yeah. And 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 the dad, uh, you know, the dad said, "We aren't having any of this." <laughs> My son, right. which was That's lost, right. has been right. found. Yeah, I, I like what you're saying, Jimmy. It made me immediately think of a, he came up with an approach to the father. 
of, of how he's going to approach the father. And it was about him designing his approach to the father and came to realize that, no, he didn't know what it is to be a son. <clears throat> it's coming to the place of embracing what it is to be a son rather than, than organizing an approach. Or I like how, Michael, you said a, a, it's transactional. Of, of having a transactional approach to the father. And that's, and, and so much of our religion and our Christianity is rooted in a, a transactional view of, of relating to the father rather than, than as, as sons yeah. and, and mm. sons, I say in <laughs> regards to inheritance, that includes the women too. Mm-hmm. I, I would like to, if I could come back to, to something Jim used, because it's one of the phrases of evangelicalism is to die daily. And it's my understanding, if I heard Jim correctly, that to die daily uh, either means to engage in some sort of self-sabotage psychologically. Uh, In other words, uh, I'm not worthy or, you know, or or, um, it's not about me. It's not about me. It's about God, you know, trying to, okay. Okay. or to die daily, if it's not being used in a psychological sense, um, has to do with the valorization uh, of suffering. The you know you, you're 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 carrying your cross, you're suffering, you know, and you know had a bad day, you're carrying your cross, you're dying daily. Well, and uh, I just want to observe that the evangelical, the 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 beauty of evangelicalism here is that they make following Jesus something anybody anywhere can do anytime. And Jesus looks down and he says, that's not how it's supposed to be. It's, it's a tough road because to die daily is to die exactly as Jesus died, which is forgiving the enemy other. And if you forgive your enemies every day and you, and you're in, and and, and you start counting and you start thinking, I'm okay, I'm going to forgive this enemy every that time. And then I'm going to forgive this enemy and this. And then I'll forgive this one twice. And, and now, now you're in a transactional mindset. And Jesus says, you want to forgive? You want to forgive like I forgive? You, 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 you can't, you can't, numbers don't, you can't work the numbers. You know, it's, yeah. a, it's a posture. It's an orientation. It's an attitude. And the evangelicals have, have reduced the gospel to this transaction god makes the possibility of salvation available it's all possible if you'll accept it if you'll accept it you'll be saved if you'll just take it but if you don't do it you won't it's all it's and and the, and so the evangelical starts with the possibility of salvation but the gospel doesn't the gospel starts with the reality of salvation and the possibility that we might embrace it yeah um you know, you know, it's funny because we were talking to think about it is because when we we're talking about uh, how this whole conversation started with uh, us talking about repent. And and for me, I, I could think of cha- the thinking for me of how I thought began mm-hmm. to change when for me, it was realizing God really is love and God really is light. And like we've talked about here, there is no darkness in God in the father that 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 for me was when how I think. Mm-hmm. began to change because all my perspectives of the father as well as my interactions with others had to shift began to shift because as my thinking about who the father is that there is no dark side to him meant that I can't cling to a dark side That's in right. me That's right And so it 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 changed it altered so so I guess that would be you would say I repented of having of of having a, responding to people in unforgiving and in hateful ways because of realizing how I was thinking about the father. Yeah, yeah. Think you can say that? It's beautiful. Okay. We we have <clears throat> the, the 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 good news of the th- the fun thing about this podcast for the last year and a half that we've been doing it is that we've had a chance to both. Um, stand back from this two-faced God thinking and tradition. Um, and at the same time, recognize that, that in a sense, um, w- without the, without the, the church as this sacrificial institution that has in a sense been the cradle of the good news of the gospel for, for 2000 years, um, 
we we've learned not to throw the baby out with the bathwater. So I I do want to say this to the evangelical. Yes, yes, you are you are right to say that you can know the Father. Okay, and if you want to call that a personal relationship with Jesus, what do you call? I don't walk around saying I got a personal relationship with my fiance. I've got a personal relationship with Lauren. I've got a personal relationship with Jim Dirk, and I don't think that way. You know, I just have friendships with you guys, and right. You, so you know, um, be very careful about that language. Um, and also know that your experience, what you're experiencing, um, ha- it, it has to be interpreted within the framework of the gospel. Because if it's inter- if your experience is interpreted within the framework of evangelicalism, you're going to end up blaming yourself every time for things that you shouldn't be even thinking about blaming yourself for. But you will, because that's the way the model works. Because in the evangelical model, God cannot take any blame for anything. God's not responsible for the wrong things that go on. So I, I really hope people will hear that. I really do. Um, because I I know for Lily and I, in, in our years in in that season and, and things we went through, um, the healing we had to go through from blaming ourselves or questioning, why did this happen? Well, we can't blame God. So it's gotta be us, you know, um, that what you just shared can really help some people. And and I really hope people can hear that and receive that and and uh, and be free from the self blame and and knowing that the Father is love and the Father is light and He's not casting blame on anybody. Yeah, <clears throat> and the, the come back to salvation. By the way, when you look at salvation, salvation. I, I mean, you may have heard that you know it's used in context of healing. You know that salvation could be healing. Well. Healing is a is a I think a good term to use for sozo. Uh, it's not, but it's not the only thing that you know. It's just an element of it. But w- what is healed in us is the way we we construct reality in our heads. That's what's healed. That's what Paul calls the transforming of our minds. And so, um, I wish I could remember. We saw this church sign yesterday. Um, it said. Uh, you're welcome at our church. You don't have to leave your brain at the door or something like that. It's something, it's very <laughs> clever. Good. It was very clever. Yeah. And, um, and Cheryl, of course said, Michael, write it down. And I said, Oh no, I'll remember it. But no. <laughs> so, um, salvation saved uh, is not from, but for, okay. We're not saved from sin. Uh, sin dies on the cross. We die on the cross. The law dies on the cross. The Satan dies on the cross. The cosmos dies on the cross. I mean, we're not saved from anything. The whole damn thing dies, right? What we have an opportunity to participate in is the viewpoint of the uh, of the creator of heaven and earth that all things will end up very, very, very good, which is the first chapter of Genesis. The first chapter of Genesis, I think I've said this before, is not a creation narrative. It's a new creation narrative because it goes all the way through seven days. Whereas the second creation story, Genesis 2, still gets you stuck in day six. You never really get to that day seven. You know, mm-hmm. so that first story is really eschatology. It's, it's all going to be fine. It's all going to be fine. Now let's talk about w- how the crap started. You know, <laughs> but the Bible, the emphasis of the Bible is that God is good and everything is going to work out. Especially as Paul says, for those that love Him. I I love how I I never thought seen it that way. How I love how you just talked about um being it's not being saved from something. It's it's like being saved for something. Um, it's like, and what immediately went to was the joke earlier I made about saving for retirement, mm-hmm. but I went, you're right. I'm not saving that money from something when I'm saving for retirement, I'm saving it for, for retirement. So it's there in the That's future. Right. That's right. I'm not going, I'm saving this money from, you know, <laughs> robbers out there, you know, or something. <laughs> yeah, it's right, like, right. So, so that's, that's a, that's a really 
good picture. And it changes the perspective from it being this negative thing of being rescued from something negative of you're, you're rescued for something positive. Yeah. That's beautiful. Yes. That's, that's oh, cool. awesome. Cool. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, guys. Well, this has been a really good conversation. Um, where can people find uh, Jim? Where can people find your book? My first book is on Amazon, and the rest of them are still in my head uh, and on my computer. All right. Well, hey, I'm really glad you're working on a, a, another book. That's awesome. I am. Yeah, That's it is. really good. And uh, and uh, I almost called you Jim. <laughs> um, Michael, where can people find your stuff? Same place, man, and all over, all over the internet, man. Just Google, you know, the dude of theology, because it's so cool. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for tuning in, everybody. I I hope you had a good 420 when it was here. (laughs) We'll talk to you all later. Like next week? Next week, man? Yes, next week.